Father, again, we come in your presence and thank you so much for the privilege of being able to pray and open the word and uh, be filled with your presence today. Father, we pray that you will be the one to speak and to touch and to transform. And we pray that we focus so much on you to the point that we allow you to work in us and through us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I give you about 10 minutes for questions and answers. From yesterday, we talked a lot about prayer and about how to uh, have a close relationship with Christ that would not be one day alone, but would be an ongoing lifestyle, a process. I want to remind you, prayer is not an event in a crisis. Prayer is the breath of the soul. You don't breathe only in crisis. You breathe 24-7. Prayer should be a lifestyle. Anyway, questions from yesterday? Okay. Yesterday you uh, told us that we shouldn't be praying for the same thing uh, over and over and over. Mm. But Jesus taught us that as the widow in front of the okay. king went and, and didn't let go until the king solved his Let me repeat the question for everybody. I said that we should not repeat again and again and again and again and again the same words. But she says in the same time, Jesus gave the example of the widow that because of her persistence got justice. Is it clear? So how do you reconcile the two? I want you to realize that when Jesus says pray without ceasing, Jesus doesn't say repeat the same request without ceasing, but he's referring to having a relationship, a connection with God that should be 24-7. Based on John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Separated from me, you can do nothing. Based on that, we should be connected with God all the time. But that doesn't mean, Lord, I want my son in Loma Linda. Would you please do it? Lord, I want my son in Loma Linda. And then you fast and you do whatever to convince God to answer your prayer. God may have a different plan. And you may want to say, like Jesus in the garden, Lord, I would like my son to be in Loma Linda, wonderful school. However, may your will be done. I will accept it. You follow me? You may want to accept God's plan that is better than your plan and that if you knew the end from the beginning, you would choose the same path. <laughs> Therefore, let God be God. So many times in prayer, we go to God and try to convince him to do our will instead of going to God and ask him to make us available to his will. Amen. Listen carefully to what I say next. It's going to be difficult. Pray for what you pray before you pray for what you pray. I know you didn't get it. I'm going to say it slow now. Pray for what to pray before you pray for what you pray. Basically, accord your prayer. With God's will. So when you say, may your will be done, mean it. Don't use it as a formula, but mean it. And give God a chance to do his will. And instead of spending time to seek an answer that is a specific answer, and if God doesn't seem to answer what is an answer, if you don't get what you want, you get discouraged and lose faith. You rather seek God's presence to the point that you know that you are with God. And whatever he answers, you may not understand, but you have peace. You will never regret if you go that route. Therefore, going now to your question, when Jesus gives an example talking about the widow, Jesus refers to a judge that was how? Unjust. Corrupted? Unjust. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Corrupt, evil, no shame for people, no fear of God. You remember? Yes. Well, when we say judge, we think it's talking about God. No. God is not that way. Yes. That judge was a corrupted judge. And Jesus says, even in that situation, because she was persistent, she got an answer. Moreover, your father knows, if you remember the context, your father knows your needs. He takes care of the flowers. He takes care of the animals. He will take care of you. So, he says, I tell you that he will do justice and he will do it how? 
speedily, quickly. And then Jesus says, do not repeat the same words as pagans. Do not bubble the word there. The same words as pagans do. Therefore, Jesus doesn't say, do like the widow. But it's a lesson by contrast. In that bad situation, and she won. In God's situation, no need. God is not corrupted. He wants to answer before you want to pray. Therefore, you don't need to repeat the same words. Present it to the Lord. He will take care of you. So pray without ceasing doesn't refer to pasture God to death until you get what you want. It means have a connection with God without ceasing. A different question. Yes. Okay. On the same question, in the Bible, it keeps on talking about prevailing prayer, persistent prayer. Um, prevailing prayer. What? Yes. Persistent, prevailing prayer. Prayer, again, I don't know. We got so used to pray for our needs. I'm not saying that is wrong. We should cast our needs upon him. The problem we have is that we just want to talk to God about needs. And the more you talk about needs, and the more you focus on needs and sins and problems, the more disparate you get. I don't see a place in the Bible where you should, it says that we should focus on problems. But in fact, we should focus on Christ. Fix your eyes upon Jesus. Therefore, in prayer, don't spend time being prevailing, talking about needs. But after you present your needs and give them to God, give them to God. You know what that means? Leave them there. And then be prevailing in a way that you seek his will. You seek to know him. Through Genesis, from Genesis to Revelation, all Bible people, all big characters, they've known God. You need to have a relationship with God. That's where you should be prevailing. To the point that you allow God to transform you, that you surrender so God could use you, and you always are open to his leading. For instance, I'm going to church. I had a board meeting. I prayed and I said, Lord, I don't want to be so focused with my board that I am blind to people around me. Therefore, I want you to please impress me and be in my mind and open my eyes, open my ears, that I could serve, I could be a blessing, I want to be used. So as I was praying that way, my wife calls and my wife says, the puppy has diarrhea. Excuse my expression, but that's what happened. We have a beautiful, 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 I mean, just gorgeous King Charles Spaniel. It's a little dog, very smart. He loves me a lot. He sleeps around my head like a crown. When I go to sleep, he put a paw on my head. I said, Gucci, put your paw here. He put it here. As soon as I keep quiet for 10 seconds, he moves it back on my head. My wife calls me and says, the puppy has diarrhea. And he's going out with blood. I'm scared. So I call my head elder. I said, I'll be a little late. Go ahead. Turn around, pick the puppy, go to the vet to drop the puppy and go to the board. My wife could not leave because her father had a stroke. And she just got him back from hospital. So she had to stay with him. We were afraid the puppy would die. I took the puppy to the vet. Guess what I prayed for? For the puppy. Guess what God said in my mind? I heard you. Stop praying for the puppy. And God put a thought that was a strange thought. Didn't you pray in the morning my presence with you? Yes. And then Romans chapter 8. All things work together. So I said, Lord, I love this puppy. But if all things work together for good, would you do something good out of this? So instead of focusing on the problem, I focused on God. I get to the vet. Guess what? Oh, the puppy ate something. They did an x-ray, long story short. He'll be okay. We give you these pills and this whatever. I'm not going to go into that area. I don't even know what to say much about that. But I'm going to say this. The vet says, oh, you are dressed nice, Mr. Goya. Where do you go? Well, I have a board meeting. What type of meeting? What type of business? I'm a pastor. Wow, we are negotiating here what happened to people when they die. Do you have an answer for us? I said, oh my, do I have an answer for you? My answer may take a little longer than you want to listen, you know? So I said, listen, 
there is good news. You know? When people die, they don't suffer. And instead of talking controversy, I talked common points, but did not say that they go straight to heaven or they go straight to hell, you know? And he says, and then I said, listen, to be continued tomorrow. <laughs> I left, prayed the whole night, went next day, finished the Bible study. They said, we have more questions. How is going to be the second coming? Is it rapture or how is it? Came next day. For the next two weeks, every day, the whole vet office, three doctors, five nurses, and two ladies from the office were listening. And then I gave them the Ten Commandments DVDs, and then I gave them the prayers DVDs, and then I gave them the revival DVDs, and then I gave them my book, and they all listened, read, watched, and they all passed the DVDs from family to family. And when we had evangelism, they came to evangelism. Do you understand why the puppy was sick? So, my point is very simple and very clear. Be persistent in prayer to make yourself available. We are so, so focused on our life that we forget that this life is short and is not worth. And we need to be so connected to God to the point that in small things or in big things, God can use us. Prayer is about making yourself available, surrendering and getting to walk with God. It's not about solving problems. Let me say this. It's better to let God focus on you than you to focus on you. And God promises that if you seek him first, he will take care of the other things. Give it a try. You'll never be sorry. Another question. No more. Great. When people have no questions, they either got everything or they got nothing. <laughs> yes. I pray one time, and I don't continue to seek him daily for my children. No, 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 no. We talk about different story. You said, should I pray continually for my children, or one time and that's it? There are eight types of prayers, prayer in the Bible. You'll find it in my prayer seminar. Go to lexingtonsdachurch.org, and you'll see it. One of them, I talked before about petition prayer. Now you talk about intercessory prayer. That's a different story. You pray as long as it takes, because as long as you pray, it gives God opportunity to keep working. Therefore, you keep praying for them so God could keep working with them. But you don't pray for them that they get a great house. You pray for their salvation. That's intercessory prayer. Different story. Okay, one more question and I'm done with questions. I don't see any hand. That's good. Oh, there. Okay. The question I have for you is, would you go so far as to say that claiming, because when it comes to surrender, a lot of us have issues that we know we need to surrender, God has convicted us we need to surrender, but we don't want to surrender because sometimes sin is fun, at least temporarily. The question I would have for you is, is surrender, is one way to help yourself surrender, to claim God's promises and give Him praise? So, I don't know what you talk about sin. I've never sinned, so that's about you guys, not about me. I'm just kidding. So, listen, surrendering is not referring to you fighting in your power, struggling to get yourself victory over sin. When I was a kid, I was not 100% home. I, I, was, I, I just did pranks all the time. And one of them... I know it's funny, but I would catch fleas from my dog and put the fleas in the tub where you take a shower and watch them trying to escape. And they would jump so high. Trust me, I've been watching many fleas jumping. <laughs> and the tub was so tall. And all of them eventually gave up and died. Later, I talked to my dad and I said, I've been praying because I have too much energy. And I get ideas, but also I get angry fast. I've been praying for patience, and the more I pray for patience, the more I lose my patience. And I said, I am laboring in prayer, and I am trying hard, and I am fighting in prayer. And my father said to me, who do you think you are to get victory over Satan? Christ got victory on the cross. You don't fight darkness 
fight in darkness. You fight darkness turning on the light. Call Jesus into your heart. That's the single hope you have. As long as Jesus is there, Satan is out. They never live together. I didn't fully get what my father said. So I said, what do you mean? And my father said, do you remember the fleece? I said, yep. How many of them escaped? None. How hard did they try? Really hard. Well, that's you. Fighting Satan. Do you get the picture? Instead of trying desperately to gain victory, we should hate sin. And we should fight sin. But this is strange. We hate and we love sin in the same time. And we want to change, but we don't want to change. I don't know if you follow me. Therefore, while you should hate sin, and never desire sin, and fight against sin, don't spend your time fighting against sin. Rather, spend your time to pray, study the Bible, study the spirit of prophecy, invite God every second in your life. Because the more of God you get, the less of Satan you get. Amen. Okay, that's the last question. Let's start our subject. No for other reason, but today at 2 o'clock my plane leaves. So imagine when we finish, I will be ruptured. <laughs> okay. Before I start, I always like to give stories. I'm going to give you an example of, because many people come and talk to me about what can they do to get their church revived. I'm going to give you an example of one thing that we did in Lexington. Uh, I gave you one story yesterday. I'm going to give you another story today. We had a meeting, and I told them, listen, we need to meet together and pray for the vision. Pray that the church together would have a clear vision that would come from God. And I said, do not plan, because you may plan something extremely good that may never bear fruits. Do not plan. Rather, let's spend time in prayer that God would give us the vision because if it is God's vision, it has God's blessing. So let's spend time together in prayer and then see what God would say. I got the leaders. We do that four times a year. I got the leaders at my house. God blessed us with 50 acres property, forest, beautiful place. We start a big, big, big bonfire. I love bonfires. <laughs> oh, it relaxes me. Anyway, and gardening. I go in my garden. I could talk about gardening forever. I could teach you how to plant a tomato that you get fruits like you can count 50 tomatoes, 40, 50 at any time. I have pictures on the plant and it keeps going and going and going. I go to church and I bring tomatoes and cucumbers, put them there and people help themselves. I just love gardening. Anyway, so, yeah, I, don't get me started on that. So, <laughs> I had tomatoes for them. I had cucumbers, I had peppers, I had eggplants spread for them, we had it already, they brought food, we had a bonfire, we got together, we sang a song or two, and then we started to pray. After that, I told them clearly, go into the forest and take a long walk. To walk around the property, it takes you one hour and 15, one hour and 20 minutes. Take a long walk and do not come back before God gives you the vision. We don't want to do our thing here. We want all to die and let God be alive. If you really want to see revival here, you need to get God's vision. And God's vision is big because God is big. You cannot settle for small things. They are from you. They are not from God. And sometimes God would give you small things, but you need to make sure that they are from God. So I said, go back, pray. When you have God's vision, come back. And they said, Pastor, we want big things. We always want, but it's not possible. What do you hear here? It's not possible. Lack of faith, discouragement, is not possible. I said, folks, as far as I learned from my Bible, God is not in vacation, and God didn't die, and God did not change. Nothing is impossible with God. Do you agree with me? Yes. If God gives you the vision, God gives you the means. God bless you. Go, pray, don't talk negative. Come back when God talks to you. They went, and they came back in five minutes. They didn't even have time to get to the garden and back. And I said, okay. And I became kind of sneaky. And I said, write on a piece of paper two most important things that God told you. They wrote. I took the papers. And I read 
a little from a few papers. We want to start church in time and finish in time. We want to fix the parking cracks. We want to... I took the papers, I put them all in the fire. <laughs> and they said, Pastor, that was, that was our vision. Why would you burn it? I said, because it's your vision. I want God's vision. And I said, do you love me? Yes. Do you love God? Yes. Go back in the forest. Don't get offended. I don't give you my vision. I don't want your vision. Go back, get God's vision. I said, before you come, you make sure that God talks to you. If God doesn't, don't come back. <laughs> Spend the night in the forest. They smiled, and I said, you see the fire? That's where your vision goes. <laughs> They love me, so they, I can afford to do that. I was smiling. I was not rude. They went back in the forest. One hour and a half later, they started to come, awfully quiet, heads down. I said, wow, something happened here. And you could see on their expression that they were moved, that they really prayed. And by now, after seven years of being together, they are people of prayer. Amen. So they come back, and that happened Actually, I said by now, that happened three years ago, okay? <clears throat> they came back, and they started to write. We want to have television. We want to have our own radio tower. We want to do so many evangelistic meetings a year. We want to do so many seminars. We want to do this and this and that. And I said, ooh, come on, slow down. That's too much. That's too big. I said, we don't have the money. We don't have the people. Let's just take one at a time or two. And they looked at me and they said, didn't you say that should be God's vision? <laughs> we prayed we got God's vision. Didn't you say that if it comes from God, God will enable us and provide the means? Yes, I did. Okay. I said, well, it's too much. <laughs> well, they accepted me because they love me so much. And it took only two simple things to do, and that's it. And they left kind of discouraged. Usually, they, when they talk to me, they live, how to say, uh, energized. Not this time. Next day, I was supposed to speak for the uh, mean, uh, prayer convention for the NAD. And we met there. Ruti Jacobson called me to speak. So I go there. I, I fly to Carolina, and uh, I speak. And after I speak, I go to my hotel room. And I usually, when I get in the room, I start praying. I got in the room. And I could not pray. I said, something wrong here. I said, Lord, what is it? Tell me what is it, because I have no peace. And after I finished praying with no answer, I took a cup of water, put it on the desk, put my cell phone besides, and opened the laptop to check my email. And by mistake, I hit the cup, and the cup spilled over the telephone and burned my telephone. Now, you need to know something about me. I am picky. I am picky in details. The way I put things in the room, in the closet, I am picky. I care for small things. I care for big things. I care for the vision. I don't think in, oh, small errors. I know it's a little exaggerated. I am kind and gracious to people, but slowly, with love and care, we don't want compromises. So, I never lost a key in my life. I never lost a phone in my life. My wife gets a cell phone and she would drop it and break it tomorrow and then she gets another one. I say, how in the world did you break two phones in a week? <laughs> you never break anything. No, not so far. <laughs> she would forget it outside in the rain. When you go back, you expect fish in the telephone, you know? I make it, I'm just... So now, I broke the phone. So I go to Ruthie. Ruthie, can I borrow your phone to call my wife? What happened to your phone? I burned it. Did you dry it? I did. Did you put it in rice? I did. It doesn't even turn on. Okay. I take my phone, call my wife. She says, hi, Ruthie. Oh, it's me. It's not Ruthie. Why would you call me on Ruthie's phone? I uh, burned my phone. <laughs> what? I burned my phone. Ha, praise the Lord. I said, what? <laughs> She says, finally, you broke something, so you'd stop bothering me when I break something. I said, okay, 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 let's move on. No, let's not move on. Let's talk about it. I said, no, <laughs> let's, let's not talk about it. We talked a little. I gave Ruthie back the phone. 
I go in my room and keep praying. And it occurred to me, it came into my mind, you fight against me. You told them to pray for my vision. I gave them my vision and you opposed it. I said, Lord, this is it. Would you please forgive me? And if you forgive me, I will go back before the church and ask forgiveness because a leader should not be proud. You see, politicians, they never do anything wrong. They can turn it like that. I will go before the church and I will fix it. But I want you to forgive me and I want you to fix everything that I said no. Whatever came from you and I opposed, I want your help to fix it. As soon as I was willing to repent, my burnt telephone started to ring. And I mean it. It's up to you if you believe it or not. I tell you the truth. It was the conference and they said, you know, we thought about sending the academy kids to do canvassing every year in your church on our expense, but because your church makes so much progress and is growing so fast, we want them to work there. It was one of the things that I opposed. We don't have the money, we don't have so many people. We da, 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 da. I got the canvassing done for free. I, turned, I, I finished talking to the conference and looked at the telephone to say, to call my wife, hey, it works. And the telephone was still off. So I looked at the telephone and it's off. And I tried to turn it off and on and it's dead. It is, there is no screen. And while I looked at the telephone, it starts ringing again. And it is a lady that I don't know. She's not an Adventist. And she says, I am the director for the local cable TV charter over Lexington. There are two companies that cover Lexington. I am the director of one of the two. And she says, we have three hours a week that we want to put spiritual programs to help Lexington grow spiritually. And she says, every church that I tried, we don't like their programs. I've been watching your programs online. For us, we charge between 7,000 and 14,000 an hour. It depends on the time of the day. We offer you three hours a week for free. Amen. You heard it? What is the amen? Come on. <laughs> three hours a week for free to reach over 130,000 households. If that's not evangelism, then what is evangelism? For free. And I'm like, that's what I opposed. And I was humbled, and I got tears. And I look, and the telephone is dead. And it starts ringing again. And the guy says, I am so-and-so in the next church, close to Lexington. We have a small group. They don't have the power or the vision. But God put in my heart to start a radio. I am going to donate the room, the utilities, make a contract with your church, and give you a big check if you are willing to start a radio station. I said, oh, Lord, I cannot take it anymore. It's too much. <laughs> yes, we'll do it. He says, you, you will? I said, absolutely, we will do it. We got the radio. I talked to my church. I said, this is what happened. This is how much we got. We need another $20,000, $23,000. I give you three months to raise the, raise the money. I, I told the church, I said, listen, I, had no, I, I confessed. I said, I had no peace. I asked God forgiveness. And whatever you said, folks, it was from God. And God gave it back to us. Oh, the church loves me even more after I confessed. <laughs> anyway, so. I gave them three months to raise the money. Three weeks later, we had 57,600. When people see that the vision comes from God, people have no problem to support it. Amen. It's not me convincing them. It is the Holy Spirit working. Amen. That's what we did. So, we got the money. We got the room. We, we, we got so many things. We sent the papers to FCC to get approved for... Uh, to have a radio station, to have a frequency. So we got a letter back from FCC that there are four frequencies available in Lexington and 16 different institutions competing for the four. Now, who do you give it? And they said it's a scale, and the more points you have, the more chances you have. Well, from those 16 institutions, we are the lowest one in points. We got two points, and everybody else had from five up. So we lost. And four out of the 16 got the four frequencies, and the others had to drop. So my board says, oh, pastor, we thought it was from God, but it obviously we are wrong. I said, no, that's what the disciples said about Jesus when he died on the cross. We thought he was Messiah. 
When do you see it in the Bible that God says something and you don't face challenge? When God says it, Satan is going to fight it. Therefore, you don't give up. You lift Egypt. When you leave Egypt, you get to the Red Sea. You don't scream. You pray. And you put your foot in the water. So we are not going to give up. Oh, pastor, this is the government, is the law. You see, the law says that if you were rejected, you cannot apply again for 10 years. Forget radio. Say, so, no, 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 no. Let's pray. But, but, you know, we got a negative. I don't care. Let's pray. My God is above the government. We should respect the government, but if God said, have radio, we will have radio. So what do you propose? Let's pray. Well, yeah, 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 we can pray, but it says here that you need to withdraw your application. Take your application back. No, leave it there. Pastor, we need to get our applications back. No, leave it there. Okay. That was June. We kept praying. July, August, September, October. People started to kind of get discouraged. I said, hey, don't give up. Well, how long should we pray? How long should you pray? As long as it takes, all, all life long. <clears throat> December 15th, we got a letter from the government. We apologize. Our machines could detect four frequencies in Lexington. But we discovered there are five. There were other people that had more points than you. They would have got the fifth. But because all the applications are gone, they would do their applications. You are the single application here. So by default, you get the fifth. Frequency. <clears throat> everything that they visioned, everything we got. Folks, if you want to see something happening in the church, you don't criticize, you don't start fighting, you start praying and inviting people. You don't need the whole church praying. Sure, we would love to have the whole church. But if you wait for the whole church, it's not going to happen. You get people who love prayer praying, not talking. Praying, and the more you pray, the more God would prepare you, and the more God could work with the church. That's how you win the battle. Okay? Okay, enough with stories. Let's try to go through the sermon. If not, we never get home, neither you nor me. So, <clears throat> oh man, we don't have time. Stories are best sermons. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I promised you yesterday to talk a little about how to prepare for the second coming. I will do my best. Listen, folks, you need to really put your seatbelts because I will do my best to go quick and touch only the important points in the sermon because we don't have time. It's a 45-minute sermon and we have 30 minutes time. Okay? So we will really go fast. Okay? So the Bible says there, go first to the last sheep of Israel. Why? Why would we have to prepare for the second coming, going first to the church? If you remember, in the parable, the virgins were all sleeping. And how could you prepare the world if the church is not prepared? While the church is extremely good, we need to experience revival as the greatest possible need. It's an emergency. We need to experience revival. Well, <clears throat> what do you preach when you want to wake up the church? You say the kingdom is at hand. Jesus is coming. It's time to wake up. Jesus is coming. It's time to get busy praying and working. Okay, so I'm going to start with this quotation before we go into the subject. By the sleeping disciples is represented a sleeping church, sleeping church when the day of God's visitation is nigh. It is time of clouds and thick darkness when to be found asleep is most perilous. Second Testimony 205. Christ is at the door. Men and women are in the last hours of probation and yet careless and foolish. That's a hard, hard paragraph. Preachers have no power to arouse them. They are asleep, asleep themselves. Sleeping ministers preaching to sleeping people. Gospel workers 121. That's a tough quotation. Now you may not love me anymore. That's good because you don't call me back so I could stay home with my wife. Listen, folks, we are all in need of revival. Would you agree? Yes. This is not to be critical of anybody. Would you agree that we need revival? Yes. Okay. How do we experience that? Jesus talked in Matthew 24 and 25 about the destruction of Jerusalem, sign of the end. And then he talks about faithful servants. You remember? And then he gives the ten virgins, the talents. 
parable, and then he talks about when he comes, he's going to say to the right, and he's going to say to the left, come because I was naked, and I was poor, and I was thirsty, and I was hungry. You remember? And I was in prison. You remember the story. I will not spend time to tell those stories. And Jesus tells them how to prepare for the second coming, giving them the parables, and saying in all parables that the way you prepare, you pray, and you watch, and you serve, 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 and you serve. You don't prepare by sleeping or doing nothing. You prepare by working. When you get an inspection in your business, you prepare by working. Oh, I am waiting. You don't wait waiting. You wait preparing by serving and putting things in order. You follow me? Okay. In all three parables, those that do not serve are lost. So, let's go. Jesus is coming. How are you preparing? Serving. Praying and serving. Now listen carefully. Are you ready? If not today, then when? Let me give you a quick story. I was in second grade. I would walk to school. When I would walk to school, there was a Turkish guy, Bayram Hassan, selling pistachio ice cream. I know it's not healthy, but if you invite me to eat pistachio ice cream, I come. It's extremely good. I mean, it's extremely good. I already have water in my mouth. And the guy would scream loud, Today you pay. Tomorrow is for free. Well, I was young and stupid. I believed him. I paid and I went next day. I want my free ice cream. He said, son, today you pay. Tomorrow is for free. I said, but I came yesterday. Oh, we don't talk yesterday. Yesterday is gone. I said, but today is tomorrow. He said, no, today is today. Yes, but it's tomorrow for yesterday. He said, we don't talk yesterday. <laughs> Today you pay. Well, he had a point. I paid and I came next day determined to get my free ice cream. I said, can I have it now? Today you pay. <laughs> well, when is tomorrow? He said, son, tomorrow never comes. <laughs> Why would we think that if we don't get ready today, we'll get ready tomorrow? Why would we want to play with the Holy Spirit and hear sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon and not get ready today? And then the impression goes away and we become cooler and cooler and less sensitive and less sensitive to the Holy Spirit. If we don't change today, we are not going to change tomorrow. When the Holy Spirit would impress you, then you need to get down and pray and say, Lord, I want it. I cannot do it. Do whatever it takes. Would you please work in me? I give you permission. And then when trials come, don't complain. Don't try to solve them because God is answering your prayer. God is changing you. Don't try to fix what God sent. Because they work, is like a school. They work to prepare you for what you prayed for. So, what will you be doing in that day when Jesus comes? Do you know what? I'm gonna, I am a prophet. I'm, I'm kidding, I'm not. But now I'm going to play the role of a prophet. I'm just kidding. I hope you know that. I'm going to tell you exactly what you'll be doing when Jesus comes. You know what? Exactly what you do today. And that's going to do tomorrow. And you'll be next day and next week. And it becomes a habit. And you wake up and you say a quick prayer. Hopefully a longer prayer. And you eat and you go to work. And you come from work and get home and take a shower and eat supper and watch news and then say a quick prayer and go to sleep and that's what you do. You follow me? And it becomes a habit and it becomes you. And if you don't change now, after 10 years of doing it every day, that's what you think is normal. Am I saying quit your jobs? No! I am saying that if we don't make God a priority today, if we don't make prayer a priority today, if we don't make serving a priority today, we will not have time tomorrow. We will never have time. You need to make time. When you want to do something, you make time for it. Do you follow? So that's what you'll be doing then. <clears throat> the time comes when you'll hear the words, he who is unjust, let him be unjust. He who is filthy, let him be filthy. And so on. You know the verse. So, 
There is a time before Jesus comes, when the door probation will close. When that day comes, you will do exactly what you do today. Today is the time of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice. Let me explain something here. We have, and listen carefully, a tendency to think that when we see prophecies being fulfilled and we see the great catastrophes happening and we see those big miracles happening and we see the great awakening and we see this and that, then we will change. No, we are wrong for many reasons. Let me explain why. Things are like the birth labor. Birth labor doesn't come and you give birth. It comes small and then gradually increases and then gradually increases. The same with catastrophes and signs. It's not zero earthquakes and then 2,000 earthquakes a day. Zero tornadoes and then 500 tornadoes a year. It is zero and then one and then 10 and then 20 and you get used as it gradually grows and you learn to live with bad economy and you learn to live with terrorism and you learn to live with catastrophes and you get so used that is no news for you. And so we don't see the signs happening because they happen gradually. And Jesus says, if they don't change because it is written, they will not change even if they see a miracle. I mean, they saw Lazarus resurrected and they tried to kill him. Therefore, don't wait for big things or for miracles to change. Change today. Because it's a matter of hardening the heart, getting insensitive to God's voice. You follow me? Okay, so let's move on. Jesus says it's going to be like in Noah's day and like in Lot's, Sodom and Gomorrah day. Those two things, how it will be when Jesus comes, like in Noah and like in Lot's day. You remember? Okay, how was it in Noah's day? How was it in Noah's day? Well, the Bible is very clear. I'm, I'm not going to spend time here. I'm going to jump over it. We don't have time. Day eight. Is it good or bad to eat? It's good. Call me when you have green beans. I'll come. <laughs> is it good to get married? I am blessed to have one of the best families. My wife is extremely supportive and loving. It's just, and she gives me good advice and she prays with me and it's good to be married, okay? For those that have a good marriage, hopefully. Hopefully all of us. Is it, they were building, they were uh, digging gardens. What's wrong to build a house? Nothing wrong. Then what's the problem? They were too busy with that. You get so much in bondage to work and to what you do that you don't see things happening around because God should come first. So, <clears throat> listen. Soon probation will come to a close. On that day, there will be no more change. However, no one will know that day. On that day, it will be business as usual. The things you do now are the things you'll do then. How was it in Noah's day? Listen carefully. Patriarchs and Prophets 95. They were all bad people and that's the reason they were lost. That's what it says? No. They were not all idolaters. There were many professed Christians, worshippers of God. Many of them, she says, helped him build the ark. Many of them went to church, went to camp meeting, ate broccoli, did the good stuff and sang in the choir and taught Sabbath school. Many of them. But by constantly procrastinating for tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll have time to pray. Tomorrow I'll have time to study. Pastor, next year I will accept to serve. By constant rejection, they became blind. They manifested contempt for the warning of God by doing just as they have done the day before. They hardened their hearts by persist persistent rejection. Now listen, I want you to think about it for a second because it is, in a way, it is a little funny. <clears throat> it was crazy. This pastor called Noah from that conference goes to his church and says, let's build an ark. And they say, 
What is an ark? Well, it's a kind of a boat. Okay, what is a boat? Okay, it's, it's a construction that floats on the water. What water? Well, it's going to rain. What is rain? You follow me? Well, God said it's going to rain. And? Well, it's going to be flood. Where? All over. How much? Above mountains. Are you crazy? Do you get the point if you lived in those days? And what should we build the ark? On the top of the mountain. Well, doesn't water go down? Why would we build the ark up? Doesn't make any sense. And they call the board and they say, our pastor ate too much last night. He has some issues. They call the conference. Would you pray for him? <laughs> you don't, when you follow God, sometimes, not everybody would understand. Because you need a lot of connection with God to hear God's plan. And therefore, Noah didn't fight them, but he kept building. And there were people who were convicted and they kept building. But this is what happened. I want you to think about it. In the last moment, God impressed the animals to come and enter the ark. If you were there and you see them coming alone, lions and giraffes and all the animals, two by two and seven by seven and so on and so forth, if you see them coming, isn't that a big miracle? A big sign. Now they have been watching him building the ark for a day, for a week, for a month. They got used. It didn't impress them anymore. They got tired of the sermons. So when they see the animals coming, they say, wow, this is a miracle. Let's get into the ark. Did they? How many of them entered the ark? Let me ask you a different question. Eight. Listen carefully now. Did God put two angels at the door of the ark and say, you are good, come in, you are bad, stay out? How many could have entered? Listen carefully. Everybody could have entered the ark. Nobody would be lost because you are not so good. But because of their unbelief, it says in Hebrew. It's not that they didn't enter the ark because they were great sinners. I'm not saying we should be sinners. It's not that they didn't enter the ark because they didn't, I don't know, serve or do that. It's because their unbelief, because they procrastinated and they got used. And when the ark, when the animals came, they said, wow, this is amazing. Wow, we got tears. Let's pray. Should we enter? Let's pray about it. What to pray about? When God says do it, don't pray about it. Do it. Should we keep Sabbath? Oh, let's pray about it. Duh. God told you to keep Sabbath. God says, enter. Enter. Oh, you know, this is moving. Oh, let's have a board meeting and talk about it and have three songs and pray about it. We go home, we think about it and we enter tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. If you don't enter now, you will not enter tomorrow. Even if you see another miracle tomorrow. Miracles don't change hearts. So, they saw the animals coming and they still don't enter. When the door is closed and the rain comes, when crisis comes, then people pray. Don't pray in crisis. Pray all the time. Amen. It's not that you should not pray in crisis. It is that you need to pray before. <clears throat> Let's move on. You know what mountain this used to be? Oh, you should know the mountain? Exactly. St. Helen. In what state? Now listen, Washington, Washington, Washington. Now listen. This is what happened. May 18, 1980. And look, the mountain, top of the mountain is missing. These are cars trying to run away from the catastrophe. 52 people were caught trying to run away. There were warnings and warnings and warnings and warnings and warnings. And there were earthquakes and <laughs> earthquakes. And first earthquake, we got to move. Oh, earthquake stopped. Oh, we move tomorrow. <laughs> earthquake, after 20 earthquakes, they got used. And then Harry Truman, you remember him? Yeah. This is the leftover. Harry Truman says, Boy, there is 11 miles between me and the mountain, a lot of forest. I built this house. I am not going to move from here. Nothing will touch me. We have seen earthquakes before. He's still there. 
300 feet under the ground. If you wait for the end time events to change, not going to happen. Balaam, you remember the story of Balaam? They come and they say, come and curse the people. And God told him that night, do not go with them because I blessed that people. You remember the story? You read it carefully. God told him that night. What did he tell them? Let me pray about it. Do you see what we do? We many times try to convert God. We try to pray in a way that we convince God to bless our plans and to let us do what we want and get his blessing in what we want instead of praying to seek, not to seek God's approval for our plan, but to seek his will and to help, to ask him to help us change our mind. Okay? So Balaam said, oh Lord, please let me go. And God said, no, you go, you'll perish. They left. They came back, offered him more. Oh, let me pray about it. Many times we use pious words, oh, let me pray, to actually hide our plans and desires. <clears throat> he prayed again. He prayed again. And he prayed again. Sure, God respects our choice. So God said, okay, go. Oh, Lord, if you let me go, I promise I will obey. Really? If you wanted to obey, why do you go? Didn't I tell you don't go? If you don't obey now, why do you think you are going to obey tomorrow? So he goes. The donkey sees the angel. That's strange. Animals do, people don't. Sees the angel and the donkey stops. He gets angry. The donkey, second time, sees the angel and gets his foot between the donkey and the rock. He gets angry with the donkey. The donkey sees the angel third time and goes down. Oh, the pastor gets angry and beats the donkey. Now listen carefully. This is the strangest part. The donkey talks. <laughs> and he doesn't say, wow, imagine if you see your dog talking to you. Imagine. He sees his donkey talking to him. He doesn't say, praise the Lord, this is a miracle, I'll turn around. He argues with the donkey. <laughs> Can you believe it? When you insist, when we insist in our ways, we become blind. No miracle would impress us. He argues with the donkey. And the angel shows up and says, leave the donkey alone. The road you go leads to perdition. You will die. Turn around. He says, oh, let me go. I will obey you. Duh. You are not obeying me now. Do you think you are going to obey me then? Folks, if we don't change today, no miracle will change us. Because we become less and less and less sensitive. We become focused. You don't have to kill people and steal and cheat and... We become so focused on innocent things, job and this and that, and we never have time for God. Therefore, it says today, don't focus about how you get victory. Don't focus about how you get saved. Focus on prayer. Let God take care of your salvation. He is able to finish what he started. Focus on prayer. Focus on study. Focus on service. God will finish what he started. God is able to save the least one. That's none of your business. Focus on prayer. You do today what God gave you to do today. You follow me? So, Balaam didn't listen. So, let's move on. I'm trying to finish. I'm trying to finish here. Paul and Agrippa, you remember? You almost persuaded me. That's how we feel. My, oh, I was almost there. Almost is not good enough. Almost in heaven is not in heaven. This is dangerous religion. You feel good that you go to church. You feel good that you keep Sabbath. You feel good that you go to camp meeting. You feel good that you return tithe. You feel good, but you don't have, if you don't have a prayer life, it's not there. So, how was it in Lot's time? The outcry is so great that they're singing, oh, I'm going to go down and see. God didn't need to go down and see. God knew exactly what was going on. God didn't need Abraham's permission to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. God wanted Abraham to intercede for them. 
I'm not going to go through the next 10 minutes and talking about what happened there, the investigative judgment, because we have no time. But I will talk about salvation there and preparation there. Listen. Listen carefully. Lot gets the stranger into his house. The people, the neighbors, people that he worked with. Oh, Jimmy, my next neighbor, he's a great guy. He mowed the grass for me. Oh, Mary, my neighbor in the right side. She's wonderful. She has two kids. They play together with our kids. People around were not all bad people. But when people come and say, let us sleep with those strangers, and Lot says no, those good people got angry. Who do you think you are? People that you don't expect, they get against you. So then the angels hit them with blindness. Now, if one of them turned blind, you say, oh, it happened. But when all 50, 100, 200, excuse me, all of them turn blind, that's a miracle. They should have said, wow, this is God's hand. Did they repent? No. No, they started to seek the door by touching, you know. <laughs> Let's find the door. No miracle would impress people that are set in certain ways. So the angel hits them with blindness and tells Lot, go get your family, get out. I am going to destroy the city. And Lot says in the Bible that he procrastinated. And so Lot talked to Mama Lot. Mama Lot, what should we do? Hey, honey, we, have, we got from the dealer last week two camels, top of the line. I mean, they have GPS, they have, you know, sensor in the bumper. They, we got two wonderful camels. And we, we have payments to those camels. And we got this wonderful house and we have payments. And I got a good job, you got a good job. And we have the kids, he works in hospital, shores of the city hall. We, we cannot just leave everything and go. Let's watch CNN and see what's happening. They turn on CNN, nothing. It's just regular business. Let's watch the weather channel. Oh, nothing. How do you imagine it's going to rain with fire? Are you crazy? I mean, maybe a, a, a thunderstorm, a tornado. It's not so bad. Let's, l listen, honey. Let's, let's sleep on it. Let's pray about it, and we decide tomorrow. What to pray when God told you get out? So he goes to his daughter. Hey, honey, the angel said so-and-so. Daddy, we'll pray about it, and we'll talk tomorrow. He goes to his uh, other daughter. Oh, my, my husband is, is uh, on call. He's at the hospital. When he comes home, we'll talk about it. None of them wanted to leave. He comes back. And this is what gets me. This is what gets me. Listen, Lot could have preserved his family if he made his home outside the city. Listen, a little distance away from the city. Enoch and Abraham walked with God, yet they did not live in the city, polluted to any kind of violence and wickedness, as did Lot. Evangelist 79. I am not saying that we should all move outside, but I am saying that we should pray. Because if God says move, don't get too stuck with your house. If you pray about it, if God says move, God is going to help you sell the house and he's going to get you a house 20 miles outside where you can have a little peace and a little garden. Oh, I cannot, Pastor. I, I'm five minutes from the work. Just take me five minutes. God has a time for everything. You should not be connected. You should not be attached to things. Things are going to burn. You need to be attached to God and to your family and to the church referring to the people, not the building. The other things will not go to heaven. You really need to be praying about things. You should not go ahead of God, but you should not go behind God. But you need to have that type of connection to hear when God says, get out. You follow me? Because if you don't get out when God says, get out, you will pay for it. In the spirit of prophecy, it gives you exactly when. You watch the signs, the economy, and so on, and the Sunday law. It gives you when to move from the big cities, when to move from the small cities. How many of us talk about that anymore? Why? Because we got so used with our jobs and our homes and our cars and our remote. You follow me? So let's not dwell too much on this. Let's move on. I just gave you a little to think about. As long as God gives me power to speak to all, I shall continue to say, 
leave the big cities, get into the country. Believers who are now living in the city will soon have to move to the country that they may save their children. <coughs> the angels struck them with blindness. They were so focused on their desires and plans and ways that they did not change. Now, what happened? <coughs> if we focus too much on here and now, and we procrastinate, we we'll lose focus on there and there. We will harden our hearts and become insensitive to God's call. We will become blind, and then nothing will change us. <clears throat> now listen to the Bible verse. Genesis 19, verse 16. While he lingered, what did he do? That's what we do. About spiritual things, about prayer, about every step in spiritual life. That's what we do. While he lingered, God is so gracious, folks. God is so gracious. God is so good. If there is something in us, God will work with you. Do not wonder how will you overcome. How are you going to serve? How are you going to change? How are you going to move? Do not ask questions. God will work with you. When you give him permission, don't worry about the means. Worry about commitment. God needs commitment. Everything else, he will take care of it. While he lingered, the man took hold of his hand. God will take you by the hand. And the hands of his two daughters. And the Lord being merciful to him. Took him out. What a God we have. If you give God permission to work. He is going to take you by hand. He's going to get you there. Have a connection with God. Don't start tomorrow. Start today. Don't look for miracles. Look for relationship. Miracles are great. But if they don't come, what are you going to do? Get discouraged? <laughs> so, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Mama Lot looked back and said, Honey, what's going to happen to our house and our cars? And she lost it. Whatever you try to save, you lose. And whatever you are willing to lose, that's what you save. We need to learn the lesson to seek God first and to trust him fully. And you cannot trust a stranger. You need to spend enough time with God to know him in order to trust him. Unless you know him, you will not trust him to be able to turn your back to the house and say, now God, God said, move, I move. You will wonder, you will worry. But if you have a relationship and you have been walking with God, when he says move, you do like Abraham. You don't wonder what's going to happen. You trust that God is able and he cares and he will take care of it. Unless you have that type of relationship, you don't have that type of trust. You follow me? God provided for Elijah. He provided for Israel in wilderness. He will carry you on his paths. He will order his angels to protect you. Water and bread will be secure. You should not worry about these things. When we worry, we say we have a small God or we say we have no relationship with him. We need to have a peace that will surpass human understanding, whatever we go through. And that comes from a relationship that is daily relationship. Not from praying when we have a need, but for praying because we want to know him. So, folks, let's finish. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in me. That's the key. Believe in me. We, I want to finish. <clears throat> I'm looking through my papers. Yep. Excuse me? Okay. Oh, we finished. Yes. Father in heaven, we had to cover a lot in very short time, but it is not what we cover that makes a difference. It is your spirit that makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. So we pray that your spirit would fill our hearts to the point that we stop focusing on problems, start, stop focusing on needs, stop focusing on self, and we start having a relationship with you and trust that you are able to take care of the other things. Please help us to be people of prayer. We pray in Jesus' name and thank you. Amen. Amen.